Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a Wednesday night edition of East Tennessee Church of Christ live on Zoom, and we're glad that you're with us tonight. We've got a good group coming in for a Wednesday night, and we're looking forward to the time we're going to spend together this evening singing some songs and praying together and studying God's Word. I'll update you about some of our sick folks. If you want to see you who are watching on uh, Facebook and YouTube, let me show you a little bit of the gallery there. You can see some of our folks who are here tonight. We can't see everybody on that screen who's here, but we're really glad to have everybody that can join us. Uh, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube and you would like to be part of the live program, if you'll send an email to the address that you're going to see on the screen during our announcements in just a minute, we'd welcome you. We'd be glad to have you with us. Just uh, send me an email. Let me know who you are and where you'd like that invitation sent, and we'll make sure that you get invited to be part of our live meeting, which usually is up, uh, you know, an hour or two before we appear on the Facebook stream and on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to come back here and talk with you about some announcements for just a few minutes before we uh, we get to the other things tonight. I need to talk about some of our sick folks, and I also need to just go over a couple of you know, sort of housekeeping things with you tonight. And so we'll try to get there in a moment. And now I think we are. And that's not where we want to be. We want to go here. And maybe we'll get there in a moment. Sorry about that. We're not quite ready for getting to our uh, lesson yet, which is where I, for some reason, was. But we are ready to go with, with the next part here. Uh, we're so glad that you're here tonight. And here's the thing about inviting a friend to watch this coming Sunday. It's just as easy, maybe easier, to invite someone to tune in and be part of our Zoom program or to watch us on Facebook or on the uh, YouTube channel. And all you got to do to invite them to the Zoom show is to have them request an invitation by sending an email to etcclive at gmail.com. And we look at those and we build that list through the week. And then once you have asked for an invitation, you get the, the uh, publication, our weekly bulletin, and you also get our invitations to all our meetings that we have. Now, the Sunday school meeting at 930 is a different list because we want that to be for K to third grade. And you, you send that to Molly Pollard. Let her know that you want to be included and get an invitation to that. But to be part of our big Sunday meeting at 1030 and this Wednesday night meeting, this is the email address to send uh, your request to, and you'll get one by uh, return mail. Now remember, there's three ways to join us every single time we meet. We're on Zoom Sunday morning at 1030 and Wednesday evening at 630. We're also on Facebook about an hour and a half to two hours really after start time because when we get done after an hour, it takes a little while to process and upload the videos. So usually we're up on Facebook within two hours of the time that our, our schedule start of 6.30. And then the same thing is true about our YouTube channel. We come up on YouTube um, about an hour and a half to two hours after the starting time of our services. So you can watch us there. On Facebook, you just search on East Tallahassee Church of Christ. It goes to our page. You scroll down. You see some of the things that Molly and other helpers are putting up there, uh, you know, day by day. And our videos are there, and you can just click on it and watch it. And uh, it's, it's a good way to check up on, on what, how things are going if you miss the Zoom show. And then on YouTube, you go to our East Tallahassee Church of Christ page. It's called a channel on YouTube, and then you can uh, watch several of them there. We really only got the channel live last Sunday. Now, so many of you are sending your contributions in by mail, and that is so helpful to us. We appreciate that. I don't have a report from this week yet, but you've been doing a good job, and I appreciate all of you who are. Remember, please mail your contribution to the P.O. Box, P.O. Box 781029. And of course, it's Tallahassee 36078. And I appreciate that. Uh, your elders are very grateful for your ongoing support during this unusual time when we can't be together because we do continue to pay the bills and we could do continue to, 
to do our work wherever we have an opportunity to do it during this stay at home time. Well, tonight we're going to talk about some of our sick folks for a couple of minutes and then we will have our prayer together. Um, Steve Hammonds had his Avastin treatment yesterday. Uh, Priscilla said he had been in bed most of the day today, got up late this afternoon, and uh, the doc advised her to let him rest and, and do what he felt like doing, and that's sort of what's happening there. Also today, they officially withdrew from the, uh, from the trial that they've been in in Birmingham, and so uh, that phase of Steve's treatment has come to a conclusion, and now he is uh, going to be cared for uh, again by Dr. Brandon Johnson over at East Alabama Medical Center and the excellent new cancer center they have there. And just please, please pray for our brother Steve. Some tough days for him, and we love Steve and Priscilla and all their family so much, and they do appreciate your prayers very much. And so always remember them, please, when you're praying. Um, let me tell you about a few sick folks before we sing. Um, Tonight, I also want us to have praise for Brother Doyle Frazier, who is so much better. Uh, Doyle has made good progress, and uh, we're thankful. He's still got a ways to go, but he's come a long way as well. He is improving day by day, and we're so glad that he is. Well, tonight, I want us to um, continue to pray for our friend Dorona Wilson. Dorona is starting five weeks of oral chemo and radiation therapy to treat colon cancer before she goes to surgery at UAB after that treatment regimen has been completed. And Dorona has asked for your prayers, and she's going to be joining us watching some of the, the broadcast, and we welcome her, and we want her to know that we love her and care for her, and we'll be praying for a our friend Dorona Wilson through this tough, tough time. Uh, June Thornell is progressing at home. She broke her arm, you remember the end of last month, and then was back in the hospital again with what thought would be pneumonia, but turned out to be strep. She's been taking her meds, and we hope that Miss June is on a, on a good, better footing these days. Um, Debbie Spivey had a stent put in recently and is recovering at home from that. And the other person I wanted to tell you about that we were really concerned about Sunday and he was in tough shape Sunday was uh, Riley Pollard. Uh, that's John's little brother. And Riley was in a house fire, was not severely burned, but he did have a very a dangerous degree of smoke inhalation. And he's much better. He came off the ventilator today at UAB and uh, he is breathing on his own with oxygen. And so we're so glad that Riley has kind of turned the corner and is doing a lot, lot better. Uh, I think almost everybody on this list got a copy of the Sunday Bulletin. Our other folks on that list of sick folks from the Sunday Bulletin are essentially the same uh, as, as they were then. And while we pray together tonight, I'm going to ask Brother Steve Bragg, if you will, to lead our prayer, especially on behalf of these sick folks and for the the situation we're in here together as a community and a church family and a whole country and world right now. But as we pray together tonight, let's all bow, and Steve Bragg is going to lead our prayer this evening. Steve? Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're able to come together in this way and to share fellowship one with another, to lift up our voices in praise to you, to give thanks to you for all that you bless us with. Father, you are God above gods. You are creator of the world, creator of the universe. You have made us and you know us better than we know ourselves. Father, we know that you made this world and we know that you understand every part of it, even viruses that come to attack us from time to time. And I help ask your help, Father, to help our nation and our state and our community to get through this time of this pandemic. Many, Father, have lost their jobs. Many, Father, are sick and many have died. And Father, I just ask you to heal our land, to bring us back 
to a place where we can gather one another together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we have many to, to lift before you tonight. We know that you are the great physician. And in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, healed many while on earth. And Father, you also healed many by your grace. And we, we depend on that, Father, and we ask for it. Father, there is an employee at Neptune here in town who has tested positive for the virus. I just ask you to be with this person. Uh, I don't know them personally, but I know who they are. And I just ask you, Father, to watch over them and their family and help them to heal. And help the spirit of fear not to spread at my employer so that uh, people will be able to keep their jobs and people will be able to continue to keep their households and, and all of those things, Father. The spirit of fear is a, is a terrible one, is a divisive one, and I pray against it in your holy name. Mm -hmm. Father, I ask for my brother Steve Hammonds. Thank you for giving him many, many uh, advantages that uh, we have had, uh, that he has had during this treatment. Father, you have given him expert opinions from doctors. You have given him uh, experimental trials of medicine. And I thank you, Father, that you've given Steve and Priscilla all of that. I ask you, Father, to give them grace now. Give Steve comfort and freedom from pain and confusion and suffering. And I ask you to be with Priscilla and the family. I praise you, Father, that Doyle Frazier is better, that many of our sick folks are better. I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful uh, that June Thornell is getting some better. I just pray that you be with her. Father, she's been through strep and a broken arm. I just I pray that you watch over her. And this time, Father, our sister Dorona Wilson is starting cancer treatment and will have surgery soon. And I just ask you to watch over her, Father, and to help her to get through this dark valley in her life and to overcome this thing that's called cancer. Father, we hate cancer and we ask you to take it away. But if not, Father, help us to do your will no matter what. Father, we ask you for Riley Pollard, uh, just so praying uh, for him to get better from uh, in breathing in that smoke and the house fire. Uh, I'm thankful that he's off the ventilator, Father. I'm thankful that he seems to be getting some better. But for the, case, for the sake of him and for the Pollard family, Father, I ask you to, to heal Riley and bring him back uh, to be with the family. Thank you, Father, for this group this, that's gathered here tonight virtually. But Father, I know that we are one in spirit and in truth, and we pray these things in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Steve. Good prayer, and continue to lift all those people up. And now, uh, I guess by what the screen is showing us, it looks like it's your turn, Gary. You got a couple of songs for us tonight? Yes, we do. For the Good. beauty of the earth, we have first song. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over, round, around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for thy church that evermore lifted holy hands above offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love Lord of all, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. <coughs> and as the deer. Mm -hmm. 
As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate your leading our singing. You know, it takes Gary has led thousands and thousands of uh, song services through the years, and I'm thankful for his willingness to do that. It's a different kind of challenge to sit there in your home and uh, sing those songs without the congregation singing along with you. And I really appreciate the good job that Gary is doing with that, as well as everybody who's got any part on the tech side or on the speaking part or just your being here to share this with us. I'm so glad that we're sharing this experience together. It is so worthwhile. The more I look at what folks are doing, uh, the more I'm persuaded that I, I'm very grateful that we have this little app to use and we're able to communicate back and forth, you know, before and after our service and during it to some degree and sing along together. I'm just so glad that uh, you have bought into this and you're part of it and we're, we're happy to share it. Now tonight, we are going back to the book of Micah for just a few minutes, and I want us to talk about very briefly what we've seen in Micah so far. You remember we talked about that big first verse in the first week where the time about 750 to 700 BC, and the author, God himself, sending this message through Micah, whose name means who is like the Lord. Uh, the subject is about the judgment that's coming to Israel and Judah. But the audience was to all the nations, to all peoples. And this first chapter, and then through some more of the book, there are symbols of catastrophic judgment that God is promising that we see in other places like Revelation. But the, the idea is, is that these things are speaking of great upheaval and a tremendous reckoning that's coming because of the sins of the people. That's what we talked about so far. And last week, we started talking more about this judgment that's coming and more specifics about why it's coming. And tonight we're going to pick up in chapter one, verse 10, and we're going to start with a funeral song, with a lamentation. And as we look at it together, these six verses that were seven verses between 10 and 16 that we'll talk about tonight are really a song of woe with a little light coming in near the end in those, those last couple of verses, but, but it's pretty bad. Actually, the light's not going to shine until the end of chapter two, so it's going to be pretty dark, and that's been happening some in our study of the minor prophets, and the reason why is that these are dark times. God's people have walked away from God. God's people have turned their backs on God for centuries. They've forsaken their covenant and turned to idolatry, treating one another terribly, total disregard, for God's standards of righteousness and morality and, and fairness and judgment with one another. And so God got to the point where his second Chronicles, the last chapter, describes that there's no more remedy. And God was going to, to divorce Israel, like he talks about in, in the book of Hosea. God was going to turn away from that nation, and he did. Well, let's pick it up in verse 10 tonight, where 
to understand the nature of this, you've got to listen to the sort of the whole song, but we're going to take it apart piece by piece and understand that it's starting with something being said about 10 cities from north to south in Israel and down into Judah and, and down below Jerusalem. And here's how it begins in verse 10. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. And Bethle Afra, roll yourselves in the dust. Well, all the way through this list of 10 cities, there are word plays with their names. And that's important to know why, why it works this way. And it's not always obvious to us as English speakers and English readers that the word plays are going on. But essentially, tell it not in Gath. The word Gath means telling or speaking. And so he's saying, don't speak in the speak town. Don't weep. And then he's saying to this city whose name means dust, roll yourselves in the dust. And there are 10 word plays like that all the way through the cities that are named here. And it's not just an oddity or a poetic device. It turns out, according to secular history, that the route the Assyrian invaders and 150 years later, the Babylonian invaders would take brought them right through those cities and then later where those cities had been. And that route of destruction and death and taking people away into captivity is being foretold in this song where each of those cities is being told a dark message with a word play, with a sort of a pun on the name of their city. It's important to know that as you study this. So you just say, well, I don't understand why God put it that way. Well, every line is significant. And it turns out to be a prophecy of how the, the invaders were going to come. Now, look at verse 11. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zanan do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away from you its standing place. That, that first one up there, Shafir, is like a fair, beautiful place, a beauty town, and it's stripped of its beauty. It's in nakedness and, and shame now. Uh, they are, are leaving their homes. They're going to have to leave their homes behind, and they're not going to be stirring around. The, the word zanan means to stir about. And he's saying, you folks of Zanon, don't stir about. Don't come out anymore. See, that's the way it works all the way through. It's this poetic, dark description of the doom that's approaching when the judgment of God is poured out on these people for their centuries of rebellion and disobedience and forsaking their God. Now, look at verse 12. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Well, these folks at Maroth wanted to hear good news, and they were waiting anxiously for something good because it was going to be bad when the invasion started, when their loved ones were taken away in captivity, when it looked like God's people were being run over by the, by the, the pagan heathens from Assyria that were notorious for their, their brutality in war, well, they were looking for something good, but unfortunately they weren't gonna find much good in this situation because disaster has come from where? From the Lord. This is coming out of God's hand. It's not just the cruel invaders. They're being used, like we said last time, as a hammer by God in order to punish these disobedient people. And it's not just happening out in these border towns. He says, this has come to the very gate of Jerusalem. Everything about this is dark and sad for people whose homes are being destroyed and they're being taken away from home. And thousands and thousands of them are dying. It's really a very dark thing. Now look at verse 13. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. So horse town, Lachish, horse town is told to harness the steeds to the to the chariots. I wonder if that's the invaders' chariots. If that's it, 
their their horses that they're famous for are now being stolen by the invaders to drive their own attacking chariots. Um, this is a border town, Lachish is. It's, it's where paganism uh, first appeared from the north, uh, coming down into Judah. It's the place, you remember when Sennacherib sent that threatening letter to King Hezekiah in 1 Kings 21? It was from this little town of Lachish that, that he sent the threatening, uh, abusive letter to Hezekiah and the people in, in Jerusalem. And Lachish was one of the cities of Judah that was captured and destroyed when the Assyrians came. They didn't make it till the Babylonians came a century and a half later. Uh, they were long before the Babylonians gone. And it may be that because idolatry and paganism came in through that gateway city, this is about 20 miles out of, out of Jerusalem, it may be that that has something to do about the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. Uh, it says, for in you were found the transgressions. The things that are finally bringing the nation down uh, were coming from there and, and were rooted there to begin with. The whole nation was guilty, but it's pointing out that these folks were especially guilty because they became the, the infector who spread the infection to others. Now, this little town being called the beginning of sin for the Israelites is not like literally true. These folks were having idolatry problems at the foot of Mount Sinai when the law was given. You remember that, right? They had made golden calves when they got tired of waiting for Moses to come down off the mountain. So not in the sense that there was, oh, no idolatry till the people of Lachish messed up. No, but it has something to do with being this gateway city through which the influence from the north and the paganism and the idolatry that had taken over Israel began to pour down into Judah. Now look at verse 14. Therefore, you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. Uh, that is Micah's hometown with a little Gath at the end to help you understand which Moresheth, where that was located. The houses of Agzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. Well, when, uh, when that kind of thing has, has happened and people are leaving their homes that have been destroyed, and all their stuff is, is being confiscated and they're being taken away into captivity. Uh, one way to think about this verse is to imagine those departing neighbors giving gifts as they're leaving, leaving their stuff behind and trusting it to others that they knew that they could leave it with. Only problem was these folks weren't coming back. Uh, now, later on, when Judah comes back from Babylonian captivity, at least some of them do, uh, there will be something to come home to, but these people were never, ever going to come home again. And there's something about deceit in the word achzib, that, that achzib would be a deceitful thing. And this is about um, deceived or lied or, or misled. And the, the word's not a real clear translation word. But anyway, something's going to happen that would fool the kings of Israel. They would be deceived by what happened there. It's just more the general kind of, uh, of mayhem that was coming. And so maybe those parting gifts were from people who were having to go away, or maybe it's just that their stuff was being toted off. Are Israel's kings being deceived by this city's people or, or its leaders or its gates? We're, we're just not sure about that, but it's not a good thing. Now, almost through with chapter one now, look at verse 15. I will again bring a conqueror to you inhabitants of Marisha, the glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Well, when you start reading about a place that's going to be conquered, that does not sound very promising, and it certainly wasn't for these people, and they were going to be overrun. They were, many of them were going to die. Uh, their land would be confiscated. The Assyrians took people away and uh, repopulated areas by moving folks around to destroy their sense of community and unity and continuity as, as a people. And all that was coming to the inhabitants of these towns. The names of Marisha there is one of them. And then I like this phrase about the glory of Israel coming to Adullam. God's bringing the conqueror in down through the country, down along this route. And I wonder if that. Adullam glory business in the text there 
when he says the glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. I wonder if that's not just about God coming in judgment and the person and, and weapons of the invaders, but if it's not about when David, before he was king, he was anointed as king, but Saul was still king. You remember when David went and hid in the caves to hide from Saul when Saul was seeking his life? Well, Adullam is the place where he went to hide. And it looked like the anointed king of Israel, who would succeed old Saul, was having to hide out in a cave. And I wonder if that's the idea here. Uh, they're a glory as a nation was about to go back into the cave, it was about to vanish from sight. I don't know for sure. Some of these things are difficult translations. Some of your versions read differently from our ESV about it. But those are some some stabs at, at what these verses might be about and why they are such a, a dark funeral kind of dirge song. Here's the last verse of chapter one we'll talk about. He says, make yourselves bald and cut off your hair. For the children of your delight, make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall, your children, shall go from you into exile. Now, this is not about an old man losing his hair and being bald. This is not a fashion statement of choosing to have a shaved head. This is about a symbol of grief, that shorn, shaved heads in Bible times were a symbol of mourning. When a person was deeply penitent, when a person was stricken by grief, it was often expressed by altering their appearance in a way that they would, would shave and, and shave the, the hair off their head as they, they mourned. And what deeper mourning could there be than like the verse says, mourning for the children of your delight. They're going to go from you into exile. Wouldn't you mourn? It came down to your children being taken away. Now, this has to be about Babylon coming on, <clears throat> excuse me, 150 years downstream from where, where this history is being given. This isn't really about the Assyrians this far south in, in Judah, but this is when the Babylonians will get there and they will take those folks away and they will take the most promising and the best and brightest away with them to Babylon and they'll leave the poorest to be sort of tenant farmers on the ground they leave behind. And these folks are gonna be bereft of their children and they're being told that this is gonna be really bad when it comes. Now, this whole chapter is one prophecy against two nations, against Northern Kingdom Israel, Southern Kingdom Judah, and they sort of bleed together and overrun each other. And this prophecy was fulfilled in at least two stages when the Assyrians came and when the Babylonians came. And all of it is negative, all of it is sad, all of it is like this funeral song. And it's a funeral, not for an individual, but for nations. It's a funeral for a way of life that these people had known and forsaken and came to the end of as these nations were just about to fall. So that's pretty dark. We're gonna take just a very few minutes here at the end to introduce the idea of chapter two after we uh, just mentioned one more time about the, um, the theme of one. If you got to remember something about chapter one, just remember that it's a funeral song, that God himself is coming in judgment against his chosen people who could have enjoyed his favor down through the centuries, but they wouldn't have God they turned against God and forgot about God and forsook God, and God was done with them. Then chapter two changes gears a little bit. And as we come to chapter two, we're gonna look at these subjects over the next couple of messages. He's going to go in detail about their sins. He's going to show that these people were pretty good at mourning over the consequences that came to them. You know, there's a big difference in mourning over the consequences of your sin and being sorry for the sin itself. He's also going to show in, in this chapter that these folks didn't really want to hear from God. They didn't want to listen to the prophet. That was not the kind of preaching they wanted to listen to. And we've seen that in some of the other minor prophet stories. And then at the very end of this dark chapter, there is that ray of hope I was talking about earlier. Verses 12 and 13, there's going to be a 
message of hope for the faithful remnant, for the people who had not forsaken God, had remained faithful to God, were still worshiping God. It's not going to be all dark because God is watching out for those people and he knows who they are and he's going to take care of them. Well, let's start in verse one of chapter two. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, the evil they thought of, because it is in the power of their hand. This is an ugly picture of premeditated sin. You know what I mean by that? This is not something that these folks were doing when they just had a, a passionate moment. This is not something when the emotions boiled over, their tempers flared. They stayed up thinking about this stuff. They laid in bed at night thinking up what they could do. It reminds you of what Psalm 36, 4 says. He plots trouble, talking about the wicked man, the wicked man while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. And then he says, it is in the power of their hand to do it. So they do it. That means there's no higher authority to them than what they can get away with. If they choose to do a thing, if they want a thing, they don't withhold their hand from it because it's in their power. It's sort of a case of they do wrong because they can. That's the kind of callousness that was characterizing the, the moral conduct of these people who are supposed to be the people of God, supposed to be living under God's commandments and, and guides for their lives, and that they had made a total mockery of ever being the people of God. And I guess the thing I'd want to ask about you and me about this verse, we can look at them and shake our heads and say, that's, that's terrible. How could anybody live that way? What do you think about when you go to bed? When you're lying there in the dark, before you fall asleep, are you thinking holy thoughts? Are you thinking things that would honor God? Are you, are you praying? Are you, are you considering spiritual things at all? I hope you're not lying in bed like the ancient Israelites trying to think up the next thing you can do to hurt somebody or take from somebody the next day. What do you think about when you go to bed? Here's verse two. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Well, you see, this is where greed, covetousness, the direct violation of the 10th command, you shall not covet, leads to breaking a bunch of other commandments. When you focus on it and think about it and put it into action, the inner sin of greed, covetousness, leads to all these other sins that they're talking about here. You know, when it says that they, they covet the fields and they, they covet the houses and the lands, doesn't that remind you of old Ahab back in 1 Kings 21? How that Ahab, you know, wanted Naboth's vineyard and pouted because Naboth wouldn't give it to him because it was his inheritance. Well, this chapter is about when they were just running roughshod like old Jezebel did over poor old Naboth and got her husband the, uh, the vineyard that he wanted by a very, very uh, wicked means. And you see, this is about the heart. This is dealing with the underlying attitudes that produced the sin in their lives that, that God is going to get them for. And when somebody disobeys a direct commandment of God, uh, when they have violated this one, especially about not coveting, you know, in Colossians 3, 5, Paul said that covetousness is idolatry. Well, covetousness really is a root sin. It is a sin that leads to all kind of other sin. Uh, Paul says, I wouldn't have known what, what covetousness was if the law had not said you shall not covet. And you remember how Paul tells Timothy and us that the love of money, greed, is the root of all kinds of evil. That it's through that craving, that's what the covetousness is, that some have wandered away from the faith and they pierced them through with many pains. Now, God gave these people laws, you remember? studying in the Pentateuch, God gave them laws about property and debt to prevent this kind of thing. God made laws about how they were not, they were not evolved by financial problems and pressures, this 
landed gentry that had divided and made made a you know a very high enabled blessed you know material things class of people and then everybody under them were serfs they were servants a caste system and god didn't want that among his people and so he built rules and laws into the law like uh, jubilee for instance like a giant reset button on the economy of agrarian israel and every 50 years all the land regardless of how it was mortgaged or where it had been sold went back to its tribal rightful places they totally rejected and neglected to obey those commands and it led to this abuse of the rich folks stealing the poor folks houses and lands to build themselves up and as this matter of dealing with their hearts is being exposed by God. It's shown up in the things that they do, like Jesus says in Mark 7. Out of the heart is where all these other sins come from. And when our hearts are covetousness and greedy, that's what's going to lead to a lot of other sin problems, just like it, it did with them. Now, a couple more verses as we come down near the end tonight. Verse 3, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising disaster. Some of your Bibles have evil there, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. This discipline was coming from the hand of God himself. He was devising it. That sounds just like Amos, doesn't it? Chapter three, when he says, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel against the whole family that I brought up out of, the, out of the land of Egypt. That explains that about the against this family, you see here in, in chapter 2, verse 3. Whose family is that? It's Abraham's family. It's the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 70 that went down to Egypt and became a nation and a nation of slaves. God brought them out and gave them land and made them his own special people. They were Abraham's family. They were proud of that connection in their flesh to Abraham, but they did not share his faith. And he says, I'm bringing calamity, disaster against this family. And he says, you're not going to be able to get out of this one. There's not going to be an escape from this disaster, and it's going to be on your neck. It's going to humble you who have been haughty against me. Um, it is a time, the verse says, of disaster. Well, when you think about the way God promised the curses that would come to these people for disobeying his law, this is just sort of the natural outcome. I mean, this is where it would go when they absolutely refused to turn. When they hated the prophets, they wouldn't listen. A disaster came from which they couldn't escape. Now, very briefly, almost done. In that day, verse 4, they shall take up taunt songs against you and moan bitterly. And they're making fun of their ruin. Say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate, he allots our fields. These covenant breakers, that's so sad. These people that had violated and walked away from the covenant, they're accusing God of breaking the covenant he's he's changed our portion he's taken away our land you hear that by the way whose land was it anyway god's land it always was god taught them that from the beginning and he said these folks are moaning that god has taken away our fields well they never were their fields they were the the tenant farmers for god they were the caretakers had been entrusted to them to be stewards of the land, not owners of it. But they got that confused. They forgot about that vital, important distinction. And in what sense of the word were the Assyrians apostates? My land is being given as these invading Assyrians come in. Well, it wasn't really my land. To the apostates, how were they apostate? Well, it's hard to imagine how pagan, hardened sinners like the Assyrians could have ever apostatized but you got your thinking cap on, you can remember that a hundred years earlier, Jonah was in Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, and the king was so taken by Jonah and his call to repentance 
uh, at least the threat of judgment against them, 40 days, and then it will be destroyed, that the king led all the people down to the least of them in repentance. And God stayed his hand and did not destroy Nineveh at that time. But within a few years, in a different king, the Assyrians had forgotten all about that. They had uh, gone back to their old ways. And so they really had apostatized from a repentance that God had granted them. And here's the last verse for tonight. Therefore, Israel, Judah, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Now, this is going back to how they first distributed the land back in the book of Joshua. Now there's no land left to divide. You remember back in Joshua 14 when the inheritance was passed out and, and tribe by tribe they had had a lot that was taken and then this land would be given, this parcel of land given. Now there's not going to be any land left to divide and a lot of the people are not going to be there anymore either. And that's a picture of judgment coming from God against people he had loved and blessed and been good to. What's the takeaway for you and me about that? What do you think it means for us to be reading this 2,700 centuries later and see God making good on his threats to take away blessings from people that he had loved, to remove them as his people from this covenant special relationship because of their hard-hearted rejection of God? Now, I know we live under the covenant of grace. I'm so thankful that we do. These folks were offered grace after grace by the prophets, and they refused it. That's the message. People that are living right don't have to live in terror of what's going to happen to them if they slip up, if they somehow are weak like you are, if you're somehow stubborn like I am, and we do wrong. But our hearts are stricken and we're brokenhearted and we want to do what's right. That's not what Israel was at all. Don't, don't let this take away the joy of your salvation in Christ. Because he's promised, I'll remember their sins and iniquities against them no more. He said, if you confess your sins, I'll confess, uh, I'll forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you and I don't have to have that kind of fear. But we ought to have an awesome, awesome respect for a God like ours who means what he says. And he'll keep you in his grace. And he will protect you and nobody can yank you out of his hand. But you've got to surrender to him. You've got to be submissive to that spirit that he promises that will come and, and live in you and, and will guide you if you'll have its guidance. And so... As we close tonight, it's sort of a somber message, I know. And I don't want to take away anybody's joy. I also don't want you to have such a disconnect that you don't think anymore about accounting to God. Because the New Testament teaches that very, very plainly as well. Let's remember these things and, and sort of ponder them as we study some more in the book of Micah in the weeks to come. Well. I appreciate you sticking with us and being with us tonight for the message and for our time together to sing and, and pray together. I'm glad we've got this midweek meeting to be able to do that. Now, this coming Sunday, remember, we'll have 930 kindergarten to third grade Sunday school class on Zoom with Molly leading that. And then 1030, our regular meeting. Don't miss that. And then on, uh, on Wednesday night again, we hope to be back. Uh, if you have interest in an adult Bible class at another time during the week, uh, some kind of uh, other class or, or opportunity, maybe it could be a, you know, a group with some interaction and we'll leave the, the view up where people can ask and answer questions. And this might be one that, that we do not end up sharing, if that would help anybody's feelings about participating, maybe to Facebook and to, uh, to YouTube. It'd be more like one of our Bible classes where within that class where we talk about things we need to talk about. If you're interested in a class like that, let me know some way. Send me an email or give me a call and let me know you'd be interested in being part of a class. But we might just try an interactive discussion uh, meeting like that. I, I think it would be a, 
fun thing to do here on Zoom. Well, thanks so much. Let me dismiss us in prayer. And after the prayer, we'll bring the, the uh, gallery back up and visit a little while. But for you who watched on, on Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we can meet together in this way since we can't physically meet together right now. Lord, I pray that the news will get better and better, that uh, the infection rate is slowing, and that we won't have to stay in this stay-at-home situation a, a whole lot longer. Give us patience while we wait and protect us from harm, Lord. Help us use the good judgment you gave us to to uh, discern how to protect ourselves and look out for one another in this situation. Again, we lift up our precious sick folks to you and ask your tenderest mercy and healing grace on them all. Lord, I do pray that you would grant us peace tonight instead of uproar. Let us not be ruled by fear and anxiety. Let us be full of trust in you. And I ask you, Father, to do this because you're our Father and we put all our confidence and our trust in you and let that diminish the power and the grip of fear on our hearts tonight. We ask you to keep us in your care. Thank you for being our father and making us your children. Dismiss us in your love, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good night, everybody. Good to have you with us this evening. We'll see you again soon.